。首先，让我们欢迎来自红帽的软件工程师 Patrick Donnelly 先生，他分享的主题是赛服文件系统的现状和未来。大家欢迎。Hello, everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk about the status and future of the Ceph file system. My name is Patrick Donnelly. I work at Red Hat, and I'm the CephFS team lead. Uh, so be, to begin, I'm going to talk about and give an introduction to uh, CephFS, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, then I'm going to give an overview of the features that we released in Luminous last year, and then finally wrap up with uh, the changes we've made in time for Remake, which will be released in a few months. So CephFS is one of the components on top of Ceph, as Sage talked about earlier in the keynote, Ceph is a unified storage system. It offers many different um, ways to access the storage that's uh, based off your use case. Uh, CephFS is just one of those use cases. In fact, it was the original use case of Ceph. Ceph is a POSIX compatible distributed file system. Uh, what this means is that uh, you can use it as a replacement for the local file system and have it shared across multiple uh, systems. There are three moving parts in CephFS. The client, uh, which is operating on the file system, the metadata server, uh, which is handling the metadata for the file system, and then RADOS, where everything eventually gets stored. The files, directories, and other metadata, everything is stored in RADOS. Uh, the, met the metadata server doesn't maintain any local state on its local file system. Uh, there's nothing, uh, the metadata server can be completely transient. The client sec can access the CephFS through two primary means, uh, the Fuse client and also the kernel client. The Fuse client is sometimes preferred if uh, you, you are not able to use the kernel client because, for example, you can't uh, use the latest version um, for whatever reason or you don't have control of the kernel in use by your clients. Uh, the kernel client is generally going to give you much better performance um, than the Fuse client. Uh, one of the hallmarks or necessary requirements of CephFS as a POSIX distributed file system is that it has coherent caching across all of the clients. So the MDS issues capabilities to the clients to give the clients permission to read and write to files. Um, and so you don't need to have to worry about the, the clients uh, reading older data or any type of eventual consistent uh, file system model that you may be familiar with from other vendors. Um, finally, another important aspect of CephFS is that the clients uh, read and write data directly to RADOS. They don't have to send the reads and writes through the metadata server. Uh, this is important for performance so that your system can scale, the clients can, uh, or you can scale the, the performance of your reads and writes with the number of clients you have available. Uh, this is a more detailed look at the architecture. Um, here we have uh, three metadata servers uh, shown above in red. There are two active metadata servers and one standby. The two active metadata servers are there to um, cooperati cooperatively uh, distribute metadata load from, uh, from the clients in terms of uh, the clients looking up files or, or mutating the metadata. And all of these uh, metadata changes and, and, and reading of the metadata is done in the metadata pool, which is stored in RADOS. The clients interact with the active metadata servers um, through uh, the set file system protocol to do opens, make dirs, uh, listers, etc. Um, and finally, when they have obtained permission to read and write a particular file from the metadata server, when they're issued a capability, they may proceed to do reads and writes directly to the data pool. So there's two pools in use by CephFS. The MDS is also protect against uh, fail failing uh, MDSs or MDSs becoming unavailable due to network partitions or some bug uh, through the use of standby MDSs so that when one of the actives fails and that standby can immediately take over and that's controlled by the monitors. So now after that introduction of CephFS I'm going to move on to uh, one of the, the features we've uh, uh, debuted in Luminous last year. 
So in Joule, um, we release CephFS as a stable system, except with the caveat that only one active metadata server was a, considered a stable configuration. In Luminous, we've corrected that, and now you can have multiple active metadata servers, uh, which allows you to scale the metadata load um, linearly with the number of active metadata servers you have. Uh, setting the number of uh, actives that you want is as simple as uh, doing an set FS set on uh, modifying the max MDS setting on the file system to control the number of actives that you want for your file system. After a period of time of changing it, the, uh, the monitors will bring one of the standbys to active, and so you can see here we have two active metadata servers available for the file system. So uh, the benefit of having multiple actives is that, again, we can scale our metadata load. The way we do this is we uh, distribute, we uh, partition the file system tree into multiple pieces and then assign those uh, partitions to uh, various metadata servers, which become authoritative for all the changes to those, part, those subtrees. Um, and, and thereby allowing the, the, the metadata load uh, on the cluster to scale. So what does this, uh, this give us? Each MDS is authoritative for a slice of, of the, the metadata, so that reduces load. One metadata server doesn't have to worry about the mutations that happen on another part of the file system tree. Um, the cluster-wide uh, cache the MDSs act as a cache for the metadata stored in the metadata pool. The cluster-wide MDS cache grows linearly with the number of MDSs. MDSs only have to cache what it's authoritative for, although it may cache other things as well um, to improve uh, uh, performance via metadata replication. Um, the cache utilization um, also increases because uh, we're, we're taking advantage of spatial locality in the, in the file system tree. Uh, clients talking to a particular metadata server for one file are likely to uh, access this another file in the same directory, so we're taking advantage of that locality. So moving on to another feature we added in Luminous uh, is subtree pinning. Um, the idea behind this is that the, the cluster operator or user could manually partition the trees, as we saw in the previous slide, um, by pinning a subtree to a particular metadata server. And that forces that subtree to uh, be exported to that MDS that you assign it to. That MDS is authoritative for that subtree. It prevents the, the metadata server balancer from, from splitting that subtree into smaller pieces or merging the subtree into a larger subtree um, and, per, and basically prevents the balancer from running at all on that subtree. You're overriding the balancer. Mm -hmm. Question, why are we adding this? Um, so to begin, um, we, we found issues in the, in the balancers, in, in the balancer in the, in the metadata server uh, in, in the Luminous release. Uh, the, the balancer and the metadata server works by tracking the load on the inodes, the files, and the directories of, of the file system. And based off of the load, the client requests on the, the metadata. It decides whether or not to split um, subtrees or merge them together or export a subtree to another um, metadata server. What we found is that there were uh, instances of imbalance um, resulting from the balancer. In particular, one metadata server would become overloaded and another metadata server would be doing almost nothing. Um, we also in, uh, observed volatility, that is, a subtree would be passed back and forth between metadata servers without ever settling down on any kind of um, uh, distribution. Um, on the, on the right, we have a graph of an experiment where we had uh, two active metadata servers and eight clients building the kernel independently. Um, 
on the y-axis, we have the number of inodes that are being cached by the two metadata servers. And on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the time to run the experiment. Um, at around the 10 minute mark, we see we have about 200,000 inodes cached between the two MDSs, which is uh, the maximum that they're permitted to cache based off of the default limit of 100,000 uh, inodes in cache at any given time. Um, which would be considered an optimal thing. Um, however, we noticed that, it, for example, um, around the 15 minute mark, rank zero, which is the purple at the top, uh, dropped its entire cache because it exported it to uh, the other active MDS, rank one, the green. And uh, rank one assumed all of the metadata. Later on, approximately five minutes later, uh, rank one sent back metadata to rank zero. And we see this kind of ping pong effect happen fairly frequently. Um, so this is the observed issue that we saw with the default balancer. Pinning subtrees allows you to override the, the balancer if it's misbehaving in this type of way um, through manual intervention. And the way you can do this is by uh, setting an extended attribute on the directory that you want to pin, and that pins that directory and all the children's subdirectories uh, to, to the, the rank that you specify. Um, and that's done with the ceph.dir.pin um, extend attribute name, and then you just assign the rank you want. Um, you can observe where the, the subtrees are actually being uh, placed by running this get subtrees uh, administrative command on each of the MDSs, and then gathering up all that data to see where the directories are being um, authoritative for, and that can also be used to monitor the, the state of the, of the system, of the cluster. And so beyond setting the, the extent attribute, you don't have to do anything else. The, the metadata servers will export it prevent the balancer from functioning on that, on that particular subtree. So some of the benefits of, of using this, um, you're again overriding the, the balancer, preventing it from, from doing something that you don't want. Uh, you can also define um, a, a, an administrative policy, for example, if you have a temporary directory in your CephFS file system and you want to prevent it from uh, affecting the load across your entire MDS cluster and you want to restrict it to a particular uh, metadata server, you could pin it to that metadata server and, and that would uh, prevent the balancer from trying to distribute the load. Um, some of the drawbacks, uh, your MDSs can become unbalanced due to this pinning, so if you have a subtree that you've created manually and it's, uh, and, it, and it's overloading that particular MDS, the balancer can't do anything to help you with that. Um, you'll have to resolve it yourself by either splitting the, the subtree more or undoing that and letting the balancer uh, do it dynamically. And then, of course, you're introducing the possibility of of human operator error into your set file system. So moving on um, to another feature we stabilized in CephFS is uh, directory fragmentation. The idea of this is that you can take a directory and split it in its uh, dynamically split into smaller pieces in the MDS. Um, this is useful uh, for performance reasons when we're storing the directory in Rados, uh, but it's also perf uh, important because it allows us to split up a directory ac across the MDS cluster. And so if I have a particularly large or hot directory, um, I can divide it into pieces and allow multiple metadata servers to, uh, to handle those without overloading one MDS with a large hot directory. Um, this was largely a result of, of the test coverage becoming complete and building our confidence that the, the directory fragmentation is stable. Um, the user-facing benefit of this is that in, uh, you can now have directories with more than 100,000 files. In Joule, we um, backported a change which prevented 
the file the, the directory from exceeding 100,000 files, and this was to prevent uh, performance anomalies we saw or performance degradation uh, because the entire a, a large directory would be stored in a single object in Rados, which would exceed maximum object sizes and cause uh, performance problems in your cluster. And so we we created that limit, and now you don't have to worry about it anymore with Luminous. Uh, finally, another feature we added in Luminous, this was uh, in 12.2.1, so right after the first uh, minor release of Luminous, uh, we added MDS cache limits by the amount of memory consumed. Um, when you were, when you uh, initially set up your uh, MDS before this change, you would provide a configuration variable MDS cache size, which took a, a, a count of inodes that uh, the MDS would limit itself to in cache. And unfortunately, it's a poor proxy for memory usage because you have to empirically determine how much memory that given number of inodes uses. And it's not applicable to all workloads because uh, some inodes, for example, directories might require more, um, more memory than, say, a regular file. So it might work for some workloads, but then you find out you're using a lot more memory for others. So what we did in this change was we allowed you to s specify the amount of memory you wanted to limit the MDS cache size to. Internally, this uses uh, C++ memory pools to uh, track the amount of bytes that the MDS cache is using. Um, it's still a soft limit, so your MDS can go above the, uh, the number of bytes that you limited the cache to. This is normally due to instances of bugs in the client not giving up capabilities that the MDS is revoking and preventing the MDS from trimming its cache. But generally, if, um, if you're running newer clients, we don't observe these types of issues anymore. Um, however, we also have this MDS cache threshold, uh, which specifies when the MDS should start complaining to the monitors uh, and issuing cluster health warnings that the uh, cache size has been, um, that it's using more than its, than its limit in the cache size. The default is 50% more. Um, and you'll start to see notices in the cluster log saying that the MDS is having trouble trimming its cache. Um, in practice, we recommend uh, using, allocating approximately twice the RAM for your MDS, both to um, allow for the MDS to go over its cache limit by some amount but also uh, acknowledging that the MDS uses RAM for other things, of course, and so two times the limit is what we normally recommend. If you want to read more about this, uh, there's a blog post in the slide deck that will be online that you can read. Okay, so now moving on to what's upcoming in Mimic in the next two or three months, that'll be released. Um, snapshots are stable. Yay, it's, we've been getting asked about that a lot. Um, this was uh, largely due to work by Zhong Yen, who's in the audience. Um, he, uh, snapshots in CephFS uh, are done per directory. Uh, so you can create a snapshot by doing a, a make dir, it's the third line in that, in that code, in a hidden dot snap directory that's present in all uh, directories in CephFS. You provide the name for the, the snapshot, and uh, that's all you need to do. CephFS handles the, the details in the background. You can then change the files and then look at the history by accessing um, the snapshot in that hidden uh, directory, um, as shown in the second to last line. Um, a note for the kernel client, uh, you need to use the latest kernel because there have been several fixes in the kernel client. Uh, or you, you need uh, to make sure that the, the fixes that have been um, uh, merged upstream are also present in your distributions kernel. Um, when you upgrade to Mimic, you actually will need to uh, set this allow new snaps file system uh, setting to true. Uh, currently, it defaults to false because it's experimental, but in Mimic new file systems, it will automatically be set to true as the default. Another uh, um, popular 
feature request that we've completed is uh, kernel quota support. Uh, this is uh, part of a cooperative effort by Luis Enriquez of SUS and uh, Zheng Yan. Um, similar to, uh, to uh, subdirectory pinnings, you can specify the quota by using the extended attribute interface. Uh, CFFS provides two different limits. You can set the maximum number of bytes for a given subtree or the maximum number of files. Um, the, the previous caveat it still applies that the limits are enforced eventually. Um, and this is due to the clients having uh, the ability to read and write files autonomously from the MDS and only occasionally updating the MDS on the, the writes that they've performed to a file. And so the, the quota changes are eventually, um, or the, the quota limits are eventually enforced. But in practice, this is, results in only negligible uh, uh, going over your quota. Finally, the kernel changes have not even merged upstream. So uh, look for that in the future. Don't, don't try it right now with the current version from uh, in Torvald's uh, repository. Uh, next, we also improved the cache limits by memory. Um, there were some structural um, issues that we knew about when we were creating the change, namely that the cache, the, the items in the MDS cache weren't tracking the containers that each MDS cache item was using. The directories and the inodes were using uh, containers, a C, like a C++ standard map. Uh, that we're, not, we're allocating space outside of the memory pool, so our, our tracking was off by a constant factor. And so we fixed that. Um, you can see the two issues there in the slide deck. And this back, a back port for this fix is coming into Luminous for 12.25. So you can expect it there as well. Uh, just to give you a quick example, um, that I'm gonna run through due to time. Uh, the MDS cache size before uh, was approximately 65% of, of the total RAM use by, by the MDS. I mean, that is, that the, the cache in use, um, as understood by the MDS based off of its own tracking, was 65% of its actual use of RAM. Afterwards, it's, uh, it's approximately 80%. So we're closer to the true RAM usage. It'll never actually converge on the, the complete RAM usage. Um, due to uh, the MDS using the RAM for other things, of course, not just the cache. And here's another look at uh, MDSs for much larger cache size. This was actually where we noticed this problem was having the largest impact. If you have an MDS with a 64 gigabyte cache, you would be using 50% more than that uh, in, in your at, at a steady state. And um, uh, th this would result in problems if you didn't allocate enough RAM for your MDS, uh, knowing that would happen. Afterwards, now it's approximately 25% more, which is um, more reasonable. I, we're pretty happy with that. Okay, um, we also have uh, obsoleted several Ceph MDS foo commands, um, like Ceph, uh, Ceph MDS dump, uh, Ceph MDS set. If you're using those in your scripts, they'll no longer work. They were deprecated in Luminous. Um, so if you're using these, please update your scripts. Uh, we've also moved the client session timeouts to the FS map, and this is so that we get a consistent view of how uh, clients are, are evicted if they don't communicate with the MDS after a certain period of time. This was uh, m mostly necessary so that we had consistent behavior um, across multiple MDSs because it was possible to configure only one MDS and the others would behave differently. Um, and in particular, this was important for NFS Ganesha, which uh, would, is able to export CephFS and issue uh, delegations, NFS delegations to its NFS clients. And if, those, and if the MDS revokes capabilities that are held by NFS Ganesha, and then that Ganesha needs to revoke delegations held by its clients, it could easily run into these timeouts. So these, you're able to now set these timeouts based off of your needs for 
For example, if you're doing NFS exports, you might want to set them higher. And also, NFS Ganesha is now able to uh, observe these timeouts um, by, its, by accessing its copy of the FS map. We've also um, made some changes to simplify the uh, uh, key management, the CephX key management for CephFS. Uh, for most use cases, we expect it'll just be using this uh, CephFS authorized command, which allows you to specify what directories you want the CephX um, key to have access to. Uh, so this um, should simplify the use case for most people and they won't have to specify or possibly screw up the magic incantation when they're doing the Ceph off commands. Um, another small change we made was uh, some introspection facilities for the MDS requests from the clients. You can now see uh, the number of creates that have been performed against an MDS or the number of inode lookups. Um, small thing, but it allows you to build uh, graphs and monitoring to see how your MDSs are being used and what your clients are doing. And also to get an idea of what kind of latency is uh, being it, for each of these operations. Okay, finally, another planned feature of Mimic, um, no promises. Uh, we're trying to integrate the NFS gateway, uh, in, in, have an integrated NFS gateway in Ceph uh, for exporting CephFS. This serves as an, a third alternative client for accessing CephFS um, through NFS. And so if in the figure in the top right, we have, a, for example, some virtual machine that's mounting an NFS server, um, Ganesha in the middle, and then uh, Ganesha is going to forward all those NFS requests, turn those into equivalent CephFS uh, requests, which get passed to the NDSs and OSTs. Um, so originally, the use case for this was uh, OpenStack. Um, we would have uh, tenants, tenant VMs, that need access to CephFS, but we want to have them on a separate uh, network, separate from the storage network so that the, the tenant VMs don't have direct access to your Ceph storage cluster. And so Ganesha acts as a gateway for this. But we also want to have a solution that can be applied in other situations. For example, if you don't want to use, if you, if fuse for your use case is too slow or you can't use it due to uh, the type of privileges it might require, um, or you, and you can't update the kernel client, then the NFS is another option for you. Um, and the important, uh, the other important aspect of this is that it allows you, uh, this also lets us set up the high availability and scale out of, of the NFS gateways and, and do that in a consistent way across different types of deployments. The way we're planning to do this for the high availability is to have the Ganesha containers managed by Kubernetes, the life cycle of, of the Ganesha containers. When uh, Ganesha becomes unavailable, if it becomes unavailable, the Kubernetes will automatically respawn a new container to replace it. And then as far as scale is concerned, um, the Ceph manager will be what is actually managing, uh, creating these <coughs> containers in, uh, in Kubernetes. And it has the option of creating multiple containers uh, for a given share uh, to, to handle scale out. And then we'll take advantage of the Kubernetes load balancer through the, the uh, proxy service mechanism uh, so that uh, multiple Ganesha containers can serve multiple clients to a single IP address. And that will allow you to do dynamic scale out. So this is a big figure that I'm gonna gloss over uh, due to time. The, the Manila, uh, for example, with Manila, that's your third, third party agent that's not necessary for this whole system to work. We'll do uh, get and put share creation requests uh, against the Ceph manager. The Ceph manager will then uh, spawn any necessary NFS Ganesha containers by talking to Kubernetes. This will be represented by the NFS gateway and, and Ganesha in the, the box in the bottom. And eventually the NFS Ganesha, after starting up, will uh, advertise itself to the, sh uh, to the manager as, as one of the services that will show up in your Ceph status and, and your clients will be able to locate the, uh, the shares. And by client, I mean Manila. Um, okay. Uh, with that, I'll leave it to questions. Thank you.
Any questions? Thanks for the update. One thing I was wondering about snapshots is how costly they are and how many you can create or if you can share with some background on the details of how snapshots work in practice. So snapshots are relatively cheap. There's there's some internal tracking that we have to do, but it's rather rather minor. It should snapshots in general should take less than a second to, to create. I believe that's Any other questions? Sure. Um, uh, would you introduce um, the uh, MDS log and and how it works in multi active MDS cluster? Uh, so you're asking about the, the the global MDS log that's present, or and how that interacts with multiple active metadata servers? So, uh, MDS log uh, policy, how that it work? The, the MDS log uh, only control, serializes access to, to the, in the MDS um, uh, for the multiple threads of the MDS currently, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact uh, having multiple actives. So that's actually one way that we've encouraged uh, in, in improving uh, throughput of your system is to have multiple active metadata servers now because one active metadata server is limited by the MDS lock. That's something we want to look into uh, fixing by breaking that lock into uh, finer pieces. But that's for the future. Did that answer your question? Uh, no. Okay.